Hello and welcome to the Fint of the Woods podcast with me, Finney and Hackett. I do apologise from the outset because of my speaking. I know that sounds really weird, but I've injured my tongue, so I'm struggling to say certain words and it hurts to speak, but I'm powering through the pain just to make this episode because I am a trooper, obviously. Also, I wish you could see where I was recording this episode right now. I'm not going to tell you, but it's very entertaining. I've got a squirrel cushion next to me. It's interesting to say the least, but we have to find places to record it when I live in a very busy house and I am recording this quite late at night so that the house is quiet. But you know, we make do and mend as they did in the war. I'm going off on a tangent today already. Let's kick off proceedings of the episode talking about another very big kicking off of proceedings at the Paris Olympics. So it's the 2024 Olympics. It's two weeks of sport in the heart of the city of love. And they had their opening ceremony the other day. And these opening ceremonies are always very grand, very elaborate, cost a lot of money, have hundreds and hundreds of people involved and usually they take place inside a stadium. That is the usual and that's how it's been for many, many years and many Olympics. But this year France have decided to do something different. They decided to turn away from the usual stadium and use the River Seine. Now this is quite a big undertaking because the River Seine goes through the heart of Paris and I understand what they wanted to do. They wanted to do something different. They have this wonderful river, very polluted and dirty river that I can't believe they're swimming in it later this week, but that's a different problem. However, they wanted to showcase the river and the architecture and the landmarks and I think it was a good idea in their minds. But I think from mind to actual action, it didn't necessarily work very well. I think everyone had very high hopes for this because of how good London 2012 was and how well our opening ceremony was executed and the closing ceremony as well was also very good. I don't remember a thing about the Rio one at all. I couldn't tell. I, I definitely watched it, but I can't remember what happened. And also, I don't really remember. Did we even have one at the 2021 Olympics? Well, they were the 2020, but they happened in... 2021 I don't even remember anyway I think there was quite a lot of expectations on this one because it was different and because it was the first proper proper big ceremony since pre-covid and it just didn't really live up to it it was so disjointed and just a bit of a mess and seemed very under rehearsed and that is quite disappointing for an event of that scale you had Lady Gaga performing at right at the beginning of the ceremony, which was nearly four hours long, over four hours, actually. And she was wonderful. I love her. I think she's a fantastic performer. I wish she did something on stage at some point in her career. It would be awful to try and get tickets because they would sell out like that. But I think I just love her. I'd love to see her do a musical, a proper musical, a classic musical like Anything Goes, either on film or on a stage. I think she'd be brilliant. But I think her performance she did at the Olympics was pre-recorded. That's what I've seen online. I don't know if it's true necessarily. But there were clips of people sitting on the banks of the Seine who had paid 500 euros to sit and get absolutely drenched and just watch a screen of the performance, which I think is absolutely baffling. But yeah, she was fantastic. But pre-recorded is a bit, bit, bit of a cop-out, don't you think? And four hours later, at the other end of the ceremony, you had... Celine Dion making her music return after her recent diagnosis with stiff person syndrome. And that was very emotional. She sang it halfway up the Eiffel Tower. She looked stunning looking out over Paris. I mean, she I bet she couldn't see a bloody thing from up there. She had blinding lights in her face. And also it was pitch black by that point. But she was very good and it was very lovely and moving to see that. However, everything in between that, was just a bit of a melee of lots of very different styles of music and dance and artistic design and different videos and different... Just It was just a bit of a mishmash of everything. It was very French and it wasn't necessarily bad. It just didn't seem to work as one cohesive thing. 
I do think that it does depend from country to country because lots of people did know the celebrities at London 2012 and the Queen and David Beckham and this, that and the other. And I didn't know quite a few of the French celebrities that they had. So I wasn't like, oh, it's them or, oh, it's, it's this person or it's this celebrity. So I do think that takes the excitement out a little bit for international viewers. But as a native viewer, I imagine it's very exciting to watch and see your home capital city be broadcast all around the world. It's a very exciting thing. But for me, I was just a bit disappointed. There was one bit where they had loads of can-can dancers. This was meant to be kind of a Moulin Rouge style section. And they were so out of time with each other. And I was absolutely baffled how they'd managed to be that out of time. I think they must have not had in-ears in or they couldn't hear the music. I know there'd been dramas earlier on in the week with striking. The Some of the dancers went on strike because of pay discrepancies or something along those lines. So I don't know if it was due to that or lack of rehearsal or whatever it was. But some of the girls didn't even kick in a can-can. It was very odd. And not what I was expecting to see when they talk about the Moulin Rouge and the Can Can. It was just a bit lacklustre. It was bizarre. There were some really, really amazing bits, kind of with the, not the set, but I'm speaking like it's a show, but those kind of big elements to it. Like they had a big mechanical horse thing with a person on it, which kind of galloped its way down the Seine for bloody ages, I have to say. It was beautiful, but it went on for a long time. It looked stunning and really, really clever. It was on some sort of kind of, I guess, a submarine. I wasn't quite sure. It was it was very clever and looked amazing. And they also, when they lit the Olympic, what's it called, Olympic big kind of ring or barrel, I don't even know what it's called, but when they light the torch in the big thing at the end, it was in a hot air balloon, which then rose and is attached by this big, strong kind of wire and it's floating above where it was originally lit, and it's now in the air. And I think that's amazing. And it looked beautiful. And then Celine was singing, and that was in the air, and it was... I loved that moment, but they were just the, they were the stand-up moments for me. You did have a few musical theatre references. We had a very small section on Les Mis. They showed some people on the barricade and all of that, so that was a nice little... Hint to Les Mis. You also had a little bit of Phantom, I think. It was hinted at, but not kind of very obviously. They didn't do a big section on Phantom because there is a lot of other things to talk about when you're talking about France, apart from musical theatre. But it was nice to see those little hints of musical theatre in the ceremony. If you haven't watched it, skip through it, watch the highlights. You can watch all the athletes getting absolutely drenched on those boats coming down the Seine. But it's, it's interesting to see, and I always think those kind of big, big theatrical events that these ceremonies have and other events like Eurovision are just amazing to watch because they're just a different scale to what you see in theatres. But it's the same kind of thing. It's a big theatrical, musical event that kind of is for many, many different types of people. And I like that and I admire that. But yeah, it it wasn't... As it was very hyped up and it just didn't quite, quite get to my expectations. Moving on to an update on a subject I've kind of been keeping track of on here over the last few episodes. And that's the sale of the Doncaster Grand. Now this big theatre in Doncaster, completely derelict, was a bingo hall before that was a theatre. But it's just sat there for years and years, decades I think. And nothing's been done to it. But it's been sold at auction in the last week for only £77,000, which doesn't seem like a lot for a building that old and that big, but I think because it's in such a state of disarray, disrepair, that so much work needs to be done to it, they're just selling it for as little, not as little, but just getting rid of it so something's done to it. And the auctioneer did state that he hopes that it's a catalyst for a positive new future for this much-loved Victorian icon. But there have been no details on the buyer or what the plans are with the building. I think it's a listed building, so they will have a few things they can't do with it. But I guess if it's in a complete state of disrepair, there's not much they can do. But I will try and keep up to date with that and see what the plans are. Because hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, they will save it and turn it into some sort of theatrical venue. Not maybe the whole building, but a small part of it. Something would be really nice if they could 
do something like that, but we shall see and I will keep you updated. Let's delve into the world of Broadway and what's been going on over there this week. We start off with the casting of the alternate for Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. The same happened over here when Nicole Scherzinger played the part of Norma. Rachel Tucker was her alternate and I think did one performance a week, maybe two. I didn't see it, I can't remember. But she did have an alternate which has kind of become a bit of a standard for some musical theatre performers in big parts to have an alternate. I know Tina is alternating quite a lot now and I don't know if Elsa had an alternate, I can't really remember. However, it's become a bit of a thing that these big parts have at least one show off a week. Imelda Staunton hasn't got an alternate for Dolly and arguably that is one of the biggest parts currently in the West End but, you know, but back to what I was talking about, Nicole Scherzinger's alternate will be Mandy Gonzalez and she will be doing one performance a week and I think she's covering for Nicole on a few other dates as well but I find it really interesting the wording of this announcement they have said that she is a guest star in this production rather than an alternate or a cover or a standby they've said that she is a guest star which is really really odd wording it makes it sound like she's doing a guest spot on Will and Grace do you know what I mean it's just an odd odd way to put it when she's going to have a dedicated performance a week playing the lead role in a revival of Sunset Boulevard and Broadway. I wouldn't call her a guest star. She's the alternate to Nicole. She's the other person playing Norma Desmond in that production. It's like when Donna Murphy did Hello Dolly on Broadway and did, I think, one performance a week for Bette Midler. I think I don't think she was a guest star. She was the alternate. She was the other Dolly. I just think guest star is very odd wording and kind of diminishes what Mandy Gonzalez will be doing which will be learning the part as much as Nicole Scherzinger will be. Very odd wording, but there you go. Talking of Jamie Lloyd Productions, I can finally talk to you about something that I've known about for a while now, but didn't want to say anything about until it was out in the public arena. And that is that Jamie Lloyd is bringing Shakespeare back to Drury Lane. At the beginning of next year, in the gap between Frozen closing those concerts and then Hercules opening... He's going to produce two Shakespeare productions at the venue for the first time in decades. And Andrew Lloyd Webber has been wanting to bring Shakespeare back since he took over the building and for a very long time. And it's going to finally happen. I know that he has been, Jamie Lloyd, on a site visit to Drury Lane. He has been there and seen the venue. So it looks like it is actually going to happen. I'm very intrigued to see how it's going to sell. I think he will get some horrendously famous people in it to sell it because Drury Lane is big and did that many people really want to go and see Shakespeare? But if you put in a couple of Oscar winners and a couple of Tony winners in it, maybe they will. Look at what he's done with Tom Holland in Romeo and Juliet and Nicole Scherzinger in Sunset Boulevard. That production sold out. It was crazy. So it's clearly a format that works. It's going to be interesting to see how he does all his minimalist stripped back stuff at one of the biggest venues in the West End. I think it's going to feel very, very odd, especially if you're sat right at the back of Drury Lane. You're going to feel so disconnected. But he might do something completely different and surprise us all. Who knows? But I'm glad this has finally kind of come out into the open and I can talk about it because I wanted to tell you all ages ago because I think it's a really, really, really interesting thing to put into Drury Lane, not a musical which is the usual for that venue. So yeah, a very exciting bit of news there and really intrigued to see how it goes down and who ends up being in it and what Shakespeare play he does, to be honest. That's probably the main thing. The Shakespeare Love is also going to be happening in New York next year as well as the free Shakespeare in the Park kind of festival is returning and it hasn't been on this year due to the fact that the Delacorte Theatre, the big outdoor theatre in Central Park, has been closed for refurbishment. But it's returning next year and they're doing Twelfth Night for free, which is amazing. And the cast is stunning. It's going to star Lupita Nyong'o, Peter Dinklage, Jesse Tyler Ferguson and Sandra Oh. All four of those people in the same production of Twelfth Night. That is a stacked cast. It's crazy. And it's free. It's free. 
I mean, if you're in New York around the time that it's on next year, just go. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you go? And also it's outdoors, which I think always adds another exciting layer to any production because you never know what the weather's going to be like. We saw that with the Olympics. Pissed it down. And I've done two outdoor shows in my time. And one of them, it was hail, rain, wind. The following year, it was a heat wave. Exactly the same week, but I guess that's British weather. But either way, it's still that little added element of fear that you no, don't quite know whether it's going to be able to happen because it might be too windy, too wet, too snowy, too sunny. Who knows? But if you can, go and see that because I think it would be, it'll be fantastic. Keeping on with the New York news, another Broadway show has found its theatre. I spoke last week or the week before about a couple of musicals which have finally booked the theatre they're going into and now it's time for the last five years to announce its venue and it's going to be going to the Hudson Theatre which is currently home to Once Upon a Mattress, is just about to be home to Once Upon a Mattress and was home to Merrily We Roll Along and it's going to play for only 14 weeks. 14 weeks, that's it, so short, such a short run. From the 18th of March, that's when previews start, and it will open officially on April the 6th. I don't know if anything's going in between Mattress and last five years, because Mattress is closing and then doing kind of a Christmas run in, I think it's in LA? I think it's in LA that it's doing its Christmas run. So there's a good few months where something could go in, but they might just leave it dark or do renovations or whatever, especially over a quieter kind of winter period, possibly. But that has finally found its venue. Nick Jonas, Adrian Warren, will be very intriguing to see those two together in a Broadway show. On a bit of a sadder note, I guess, another Broadway show has had to delay its opening. So this is the new musical, Maybe a Happy Ending, which is going to star Darren Chris and Helen J. Shen. And it was originally meant to open, I think, in October, but now it's been postponed to November the 12th as its official opening night at the Belasco Theatre. And this is due to supply chain issues. So apparently the set has got a lot of video, video kind of projection parts and it's quite complicated and quite intricate set. And they are having issues with certain elements to get that set built in time due to kind of the COVID impact on the theatre industry and also malfunctioning other things. And it's, there's lots of elements of kind of stacked up to cause this issue. It's a big thing to delay a Broadway opening by a month. So the issue must be quite severe, but I'm wishing them all luck and hopefully they will open on that date that they're hoping to now in November. Yet another theatre is in need of saving, this time in New York, and that is the West Bank Cafe and Laurie Beachman Theatre, named after the actress Laurie Beachman. So a GoFundMe has been launched to save this venue, and this isn't the first time this has had to happen. During Covid, they were really running out of money and they were going to have to shut the venue and they did this big kind of Christmas Day telethon thing with loads of Broadway celebrities and they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep the theatre afloat. So it's already been saved once in the last four years and now it's going to have to happen again because the venue is set to close this August but could now be saved thanks to this GoFundMe set up by lots of Broadway people and it's due to a lack of financial support from multiple different kind of New York organisations and the government and this, that and the other and not receiving certain financial support during covid that's affected it as well but at the time of recording they've raised $65,000 on the gofundme but the goal is $850,000 so they've still got a long way to go they're not even kind of 10% of the way there but i really really hope that they manage to do it it's a very historic cabaret venue in new york the best people have performed there over the years so many people and lots of people have worked there. I think I've read something about the fact that um, Al, not Al Pacino, what's his name? Not Billy Joel, another bald man, who's in Die Hard. What's his name? Oh my God, I'm going crazy. You know who I mean, though. Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis used to work at the venue as a waiter, apparently, which I think is quite entertaining. However, it's got a lot of history to it, and I just hope they save it. As I've said many times, I'm all for saving venues and keeping them 
afloat, but they need to raise a lot of money in quite a short amount of time. And I really, really hope they manage to do it. So if you can, go donate. If you search on Google, it will come up and give them something to keep the venue going. But that's not the only place having a bit of financial trouble in New York this past week. So Sleep No More, which is an immersive indoor promenade performance, that's what the website says, produced by the British theatre company Punch Drunk, which has been open since 2011, is set to close at the end of September. However, there's more to it than meets the eye. They are facing eviction due to $4.5 million owed in back rent. $4.5 million, that's a lot of money. They were sued to be evicted in March as the landlord alleged that the permit ran out two years ago for the production to still be happening in this building that they're doing it in. However, Sleep No More then filed a countersuit claiming they had agreed to amend it, amend their contract, as the landlord was facing financial ruin and they wanted to sort it out. However, it doesn't seem like it's all going to plan. And now Centaur, who are the landlords, that's the name of them, want to dismiss this countersuit and get the money, get this four point, how much, $4.5 million in back rent from the company who have been there for well over a decade now. That's a lot of money. I mean, it is a building in New York. It's going to cost a lot to rent, but $4.5 million? And they just have to, they have to pay it, I think. I think that's what the landlords are saying, is that they have to pay it, but now there's discrepancies with what the contract said and this, that and the other. Sounds a bit stressful, doesn't it? Let's come back over to, for once, slightly calmer shores in the UK theatre scene and to the new revival of The Producers. Now, this is the first, I think, major London revival of the show since it was at the Drury Lane in 2004 to 2007, I think that's when it was. And this is going to be running at the Menier Chocolate Factory from November until March next year. And it's going to be directed by Patrick Marber, who was behind the very successful Leopoldstadt and also wrote the Oscar-nominated screenplay of one of my favourite films, Notes on a Scandal. If you've never seen it, Kate Blanchett, Judy Dench, lesbians, cats... She's a paedophile, I think, as well. It's a bit stressful and the music is fantastic and it's just a brilliant, brilliant film. Go and watch it if you've never seen it. Anyway, tangent again. But this is extremely exciting that The Producers is coming back. I love this show. It is so funny and cleverly written. And I did think for a time that it would never come back because I thought people might be too offended by it. But if Book of Mormon's still running, The Producers is probably similar to that to be fair so I am very glad that it's coming back I think it's going to be brilliant to do it in a slightly more intimate setting but I do think this kind of is a springboard like the diving at the Olympics a springboard for a major revival of the show elsewhere a lot of stuff at the Many Air Chocolate Factory goes further like their revival of Little Night Music which ended up going to Broadway Sunday in the Park with George which also ended up going to Broadway with Jenna Russell and Daniel Evans they have shows that transfer well Merrily We Roll Along was at the Many Air Chocolate Factory originally about a decade ago and look that's just been on Broadway and won many Tonys So I do think this is what this is. I think it will go to the West End, it will transfer to a bigger venue, and then I think it will go to Broadway. There's been rumblings of a Broadway revival of the producers for a while now, and this just seems too perfect for it not to be linked to that, but maybe that's just me seeing things with my weird theatrical mind. But I'm really excited to go and see this and see how different it is from the original, because that original production was such a success both here in the UK and especially on Broadway in the States and worldwide. So it'll be interesting to see how different it is, how much has changed, how much is the same. But yeah, finally, it's coming back. Another movie is getting a stage treatment again in Manchester. So they've just had Burlesque up in Manchester making its world premiere. And now the adaptation of the 2001 film A Knight's Tale will be making its debut in April next year at the Manchester Opera House. And this is a film that I had never heard of before I saw it in the news this week. But it's a film that starred Heath Ledger, 
and this new musical is going to be a jukebox musical. Now, do we need another jukebox musical? Maybe, maybe not. I do like them. I do like a jukebox, but there are so many, especially ones where they don't use a song from one artist. I always think it's a bit confusing. However, it got a very big reaction online that this was making a stage debut, so I need to watch the film and see what it's like and see if it's going to work as a musical. I genuinely don't know anything about it. I'd never heard of it until this announcement this week. Maybe that's just me being ignorant, but I don't know. I just never heard of it. But now I have heard of it, and now we will be seeing it on the musical theatre stage at some time next year. As I often do, I'm going to sum up the episode with a bit of casting news. However, I want to talk about a certain bit of casting news first, and also a bit of exciting news about the podcast. So, the UK tour of Ghost has announced its casting, and one of my nearest and dearest friends, Kiana Jackson-Jones, will be making her professional debut in the role of Louise, and also second cover, Oda May. And I can finally talk about it. I've known for a few weeks now about the casting and the fact that she got it, and also I've been talking to her and chatting to her throughout the process of her auditioning and this, that and the other... And I'm so thrilled for her. So I thought I'd give her a little bit of a shout out on here because she deserves it. And I can't wait to go and see her in it and see her on stage. She is marvellous. A dame in the making, I often say to her, because she really is. But also, fingers crossed this all goes to plan, but she's going to be my first guest on the podcast. Finally, after saying for ages that I want to have someone else to talk to on this podcast, she's going to be my first special guest to talk to about anything really about graduation and life as a new grad auditioning and her first ever professional job and this that and the other we'll just have a natter and let you listen in and I am hoping to do this with a few people forthcoming I want to make it a more regular thing alongside these episodes so we'll have a news episode a week and hopefully every week or so also an interview episode as well which would be hopefully fingers crossed marvellous so yeah, a bit of exciting news for her and also for the podcast getting its first guest. So watch this space over the next couple of weeks. Now moving on to some other casting news, the tour of Now That's What I Call a Musical has announced a bit more of its lead casting. Melissa Jacks and Sam Bailey will join Nina Wadia in this new jukebox musical directed and choreographed by Craig Revel Horwood and it celebrates the 40-year anniversary of the Now music kind of albums and it's going to feature music from Whitney Houston, Wham, Blondie, Tears for Fears, Spandau Ballet and lots of other people which does sound quite camp and I know I was just moaning about jukebox musicals but that sounds quite interesting. I'm intrigued but Melissa Jacks and Sam Bailey will be sharing the role of April and there will also be guest stars along the way at different venues and these are going to be Sunita Carol Decker, Jay Osmond, and wait for it, Sonia. Sonia. Better the devil you know Sonia is going to be in this tour. I think she's in it in Brighton, which is nearest to me, which is where I will be going to see it, hopefully, because I need to see her. And if she doesn't sing Better the Devil You Know, then what's the point in her even being there? She needs to be there in her quality street dress that she wore at Eurovision. Otherwise, what's the point? Kerry Ellis is going to be joining the UK tour of 101 Dalmatians at the end of its tour later this year in Oxford and in Brighton over Christmas. And the current part of Corella Deville, which is what she will be playing, is being played by Kim Marsh and Faye Toza. They're alternating it at different venues. And this is a reimagined version of the Regent's Park Open Air production that was on a couple of years ago, which was really bizarre. I loved the set, but I don't remember much else about it. I remember, I think Corella got electrocuted or something. Or the dogs did. I can't really remember, but the puppets were cool and they had a live Dalmatian at the end, which was worth it, to be fair. Joy Woods, Shayna Taub, Colin Donnell and Ben Levi Ross will join the cast of Ragtime at New York City Centre later this year. So this is a two-week production in November and they are joining the previously announced Joshua Henry, Casey Levy and Brandon Uranowitz who are already announced to be in this production of Ragtime. I do think, as well as I said about the producers, that this production of Ragtime 
might lead to a Broadway revival. Again, there's been rumblings and wanting for a Broadway revival of Ragtime for quite a while. The last one, I think, was in 2009. But I think I think it's time for it to come back. And I think there is a bit of a hunger for it. So maybe this production will lead to a revival of that. And finally, Adam Lambert and Ali Cravalho will join Cabaret later this year as the MC and Sally Bowles. They will be replacing Eddie Redmayne and Gail Rankin from September until March 2025. This is a limited run with them in the roles. However, I think this will end up a bit like the casting situation in London where they just kind of put in a pair of actors to play the part for three or four months and then replace them, then replace them. I don't know if I like that because it feels like they're just randomly star casting people in those parts. However, it seems to be working and it's still selling and they're still selling those ridiculously priced tickets. But how long that will last, we'll have to wait and see. Especially for Cabaret on Broadway, it wasn't as successful Tony wise and awards wise as it was over here so maybe that will hinder it but who knows we'll have to wait and see as always I say that a lot don't I we'll have to wait and see but it's so true with theatre we never quite know what's going to happen this week's Fin to the Woods vaguely fun fact is the fact that Kristen Chenoweth now has a day named after her July 24th which is also her birthday is now officially Kristen Chenoweth day in the city of Boston, which is just wonderful. Thank you once again for listening to the Fin to the Woods podcast. I really do appreciate it. Do share, do rate, do talk to your friends about it. Spread the word because I really enjoy doing these and I hope you enjoy listening to them. And I will speak to you once again next week. (laughs) 